Yeah, it's he's really lovely. I mean, he does what all babies do at that age. He, he sleeps a lot, he eats a lot, and he um, <clears throat> leaves a lot in the nappy. <laughs> well, that's that's how babies are. So massive congratulations from everyone at Good Food. Uh, so now I've got some questions. As I said, we're absolutely bombarded with questions um, from the public. So these are all questions from yeah from the public. And question number one would be. Um, how do you how do you go about planning your menu for the week at home? So all these questions are related to you cooking at home. And I suppose you've probably spent more time at home in the last three months than you have done in the last forty years. So I think people are yeah, people are asking these questions. How have you gone about planning planning what you're going to eat for the week? That's that's true, isn't it? I mean, I, I don't think I've ever spent so much time at home or, or cooked um, cooked for, for two, <laughs> myself and my wife, uh, ever. It's unbelievable. Um, I, I think first, first of all, I, I went through all the cupboards and, uh, and discovered stuff that was uh, either out of date or very soon out of date. So I managed yeah. to use most of those up and um, buy that. And, and there was tons of it. And then freezer. I emptied the freezer and we just worked <laughs> our way through the freezer. Uh, and it's amazing what you can do if you've a little bit of imagination. Um, but but then since then, since all of that's gone, it, it's a question of just going down the street and in the neighbourhood. And, you know, I live in South London, but there are so many little independent shops. So independent mm. butchers, independent fishmongers. I mean, we're blessed. We've got two fishmongers, two very good butchers here. Um, and then And then just your corner shops and all of that and really trying to help them and then also a lot of the restaurants decided to do takeaway well not just takeaway but sell some of the produce that they were getting from some of their suppliers so by helping them as well so a, a lot of that that's what i've been doing a lot of but very but, plain food nothing fancy <laughs> <laughs> but that's i mean there, 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 are, there are good things to take out of what's been done if, if helping the local as you said that the um, supporting the local businesses and helping local suppliers i mean i i've, I've been it's completely overwhelmed by that um, sense of camaraderie people have had. And as you say, you know, I've, been, I've been doing all my shopping in the um, in a pub that's turned itself into into a produce store, which and and, and the produce has been absolutely amazing. Um, the other question is: Is there a dish you really? What's the dish you enjoy making most? I mean, you said to me earlier you've taken on yoga. So is there is there a, is is there a dish that you kind of you find really therapeutic or very mindful to mindful making? Yeah, Negroni. Uh, that's not really a dish, is it, Chef? <laughs> I've, I found a, an amazing uh, uh, yeah, likeness to, to Negroni. I'll have to get out of that habit when I get back to work. But no, on a, on a serious note, um, food-wise, it, it's, I mean, I, I said earlier, you know, what, what I eat at home is very, very simple food, good ingredients uh, and not messed around with too much. And uh, I, mean, I mean, for tonight, for example, I've, I've got a rack of lamb, uh, Herdwick lamb, um, and um, I've got just, a, it's going to be roasted on a, a bed of potatoes. I've got fennel, carrot, onion. It's just a nice little piece of meat that's roasted. We probably won't eat it all and I'll have the rest tomorrow lunch for, for lunch cold. So, you know, it, it's just simple. And you know, no, no, no fancying around. It's not restaurant food. It's just good, wholesome home cooking. Fantastic. And then we've got we've got questions about specific ingredients. I think people just want to know about how to cook them and, and how you mm. would cook them. And I found that by, for example, my neighbour gave me a trout and then we had a couple of questions about trout. I'm wondering if people have got more time on their hands. They've been out fishing and obviously trout's the most common fish to, to yeah. catch from our rivers. So one of the questions we had from uh, from a chap in Wales uh, Craig, who said, how would you cook a whole trout? Well, I mean, whole trout um, en papillote. So literally take the whole, whole trout, gut it, yeah. uh, and remove the gills and fins. And then you place it in a foil, in a large sheet of foil, a little bit of butter, maybe a touch of fennel or um, uh, sorrel is great. Yeah. Trout because it's got a lovely acidity to it. A bit of seasoning. Maybe a splash of perno, which gives it a Ooh. bit of aniseed flavour. Wrap it up, nice yeah. and tight. Uh, and then pop in the oven at 180 degrees. I would say for a normal sized trout, probably no more than about 10, 15, no, 10, 12 minutes. Wow, that's uh, delicious. Snip it open and you've got all the lovely juices and that's cooked on the bone and it'll be lovely and succulent. Otherwise, I mean, I think that tr I mean, trout is very underrated yeah. uh, and, and really good value, whether it's uh, river trout or... Um, or sea trout, uh, like the Welsh, um, what do they call it, sewin, I think, don't they? Sewin, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, that also makes a great uh, gravel axe. So oh, you're wow. 
basic gravel axe of yeah. salt, sugar, and then some kind of a herb with it, uh, and then just a, a, you know cured for uh, a few hours. You don't need to cure it too long because it's not as thick. It yeah. makes the most amazing gravel axe. So you say for a few hours, especially if it's fresh from the river, it doesn't need to, it doesn't need much more than a couple of hours. That sounds good. And then we had a, a specific question. I think it's what well, it's a, a nation's favourite dish, and someone wanted to know how you personally roast a chicken. So how would how would you roast a chicken? First of all, get a quality chicken. Okay. <laughs> that that is you know that's the that's the top tip, isn't it? The top yeah. tip. quality chicken, and by that I mean not a chicken that only costs something like two quid for a whole bird. Uh, you know that's that's not going to be good. Um, so. Quality chicken. Um, I like what I like to do is is just put a little bit of butter under the skin. So you just use your two fingers and and sort of open up a cavity um, between the skin and the flesh, and put a little bit of butter in there. And then you can put some herbs too. So maybe a chop chop rosemary, chopped thyme, or whatever. And another thing, th this is what Grandma used to do. Grandma Rue, she used to roast the chicken, but she used to put um, a little pot of you know petit suisse. Yes. Uh, the, the, it's um like it's not it's cheese. It's uh it's like um it's not Philadelphia. Really. It's not it's not cream cheese. Well, kind of. It's 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 it's, it's looser than that. It's yeah. I know. I I it's I, yeah, I've got French cheese. Butter, so yeah, so yeah. you choose to put a spoonful of that in the cavity of the chicken. Mm. Uh, and and when you roast the chicken, you turn it one side and the other. And so that used to just melt and permeate in the flesh. I would say the closest thing's mascarpone. Would you say mascarpone? Yeah. 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 Probably mascarpone. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. any kind of cream like that, even creme fraiche would do. Yeah. Uh, so a spoonful mm. of the cavity. And then as it sort of bubbles away and melts, it sort of feeds from the inside. So yeah. you get lovely richness and moistness from that. And then you tip, tip it up and, and any of the juices come out and that makes adds to the gravy and it's an amazing yeah. flavour. That sounds incredible. So you get a creamy gravy anyway, when it's just the jus from the, from the chicken, yeah. but you get, you get the cream. Yeah. Yeah. Now, someone's asked a question about Wagyu steak, and I mean, I think it's down to the cut, but for people that don't know, they're obviously very lucky to be eating Wagyu on lockdown, but they said, if you had a Wagyu steak, how would you cook it? Um, again, it depends on the cut, but yeah. for, for me, Wagyu, Wagyu steak needs to be cooked um, rareish. I mean, and, you know, not, not too... It's more of a medium rare. It's a particular way of cooking Wagyu beef. And the fattier it is, I think um, the more the more difficult it is to get right. Because, you know, when you press on a steak, you, the, yeah. the, the, the classic way you press. And, exactly. So, so you can see how it's done. The fattier it is, the, 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 the more the, when you press down, the resistance is completely different. So it, it, it's quite a difficult meat to get 100 percent right. It, it, it really is. Um, but I was going to say practice makes perfect, but it's a very, very expensive cut to, <laughs> to practice. With. I, I understand the question. If, if you're cooking a steak, how, how do you how do you test the duck? Do you do you do the do you do the duck test or do you use a thermometer? Use that test? I don't use a thermometer. Oh. I, I, I use the you know press with a finger test, and uh, <laughs> I, I like mine more on the medium side uh, than than the rare side. It, but again, it depends on the cut. If it's skirt, for example, or even rump steak, I'll eat that rare, very rare indeed. Um, whereas the, you know, a a ribeye, I like it medium rareish. You yeah. the medium side. So yeah, it depends on the cut. But I, I think the important thing with wagyu as well is is to get a nice color on it. Get a really really good coloration on it because, uh, and you don't need much fat either because it's a very fatty fatty uh, beef. So, uh, and the, the flavor of that is immense. I, I think you're right. I think that's where I, the advice I always give with steak is it's down to the cut, not the mm -hmm. not how you like it eaten. I mean, fillet you can eat raw. I mean, because you, you can make carpaccio fantastic, but you're certainly not going to eat rib river beef raw because of all the fat that runs through it. So it is down to the cut and the cut that you like. So how, how you how you'd like it. Now, um, I thought this is a really good question, especially for for people. Someone's asked, what's what do you think is the most versatile dish, not actual actual pan to have in the kitchen? So if you're going to buy one pan, or what dish do you find you you cook the most with? Yeah, um, gosh. Well, I, I suppose nowadays, you know, everybody's got a non-stick pan. Yeah. Which you know, which is so versatile, and you can use for anything. Um, but a good quality cast iron, <coughs> cast iron pan, 
an yeah. old-fashioned cast iron pan is, I think, probably you know the, the one utensil that I I would probably grab um, every time because the cast iron pan tends well it will retain heat far more. You can you can heat it up even far more. You know, you can it can take you know much much higher temperature than any other kind of pan. And if you're not you know, confident about it being non-stick, then what you can do is take a piece of greaseproof paper and put that in the pan yeah. and then put the fish or the steak on there or whatever, um, and obviously with oil. And that greaseproof paper will act as a non-stick layer. Um, but a good quality cast iron pan, and it's, you know, it's perfect for making omelets as well. And, mm. and they're, they're, they're just... I think, you know, just a, a great piece of, of utensil that you should have in your kitchen. I think that's such an amazing bit of advice. And the first time you put that piece of paper in, you think it's going to burn. And yeah. it doesn't. And it doesn't. <laughs> and I, I did that yesterday. So I, I baked some sliced potatoes on the grease free paper in an oven. And the people, like, my wife was like, surely that's going to, that's going to burn. And it doesn't. The grease free paper, as you said, acts like a, a non-stick uh, non layer. That's well, absolutely for very delicate fish, for example. Yeah. And uh, I sometimes even use that trick uh, in, in a non-stick pan, because if you've got really delicate fish, that, you know, like, like maybe hake, uh, and you don't want it to stick at all, then the, non, then the, the greaseproof paper works beautifully. Uh, we've got lots of people, I mean, I've got lots of people asking you if you could have one dish, what would it be? So it's a big, you know, I, I love your answer to this one every time. But if they're asking, they're asking, uh, yeah, for your, for your absolute, you've got to eat one thing for the rest of your... We have other people asking for a three-course menu, but I think we'll, we'll stick with, the, we'll stick with the, the one dish, your favourite yeah. dish of all time. Well, I, I've had this, strangely enough, uh, once during lockdown, and I'm, oh. I might, if I'm lucky, um, ha have it again on Saturday. If the weather's good, I'll, I'll do this on the barbecue. But it's a, a grilled or roast lobster. Yeah, with garlic butter, and 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 you've got to be generous with the garlic yeah. and the butter on this. Lots of it, um, and um, then big fat chips um, and cooked in goose fat, and sprinkled oh, molten sea salt, uh, and then a bernet sauce on the side. Uh, and uh, if I'm feeling really, really extravagant, uh, vintage champagne. Ooh, that gets me salivating every time. And it's when you say the goose fat, that's what actually, to me, that's the icing on the cake. <laughs> and then you normally finish it, you normally finish it with on a beautiful beach somewhere, unfortunately. <laughs> well, I'm sure your, your garden's absolutely beautiful. Um, so do you, have you been barbecuing a lot with, the, with this weather, that's, with the nice weather that we've been having? Um, actually, no, I've, I've only, I've only done two recently. So yeah, yeah. We, we, we didn't. You know, I, I found lockdown has been... It's, it's just gone so quickly. Yeah. The weeks have gone so quickly. I, I have been actually quite busy doing doing a lot of you know a lot of interviews, a lot of stuff like this. Um, some some filming as well, all remote, obviously, and very careful because of social distancing. Um, but and and then the bulk of my time as well, um, you know, making sure that well, all, all the stuff of trying to keep a business afloat uh, yeah. without getting into the nitty gritty of it. But but you know, basically trying to keep keep the businesses going uh, and retaining all of our staff and making sure that they are you know that they are well looked after so so that that has taken up an incredible amount of time um but if if you had a, if you've got a go-to barbecue dish is there something you've mentioned the lobster is there something you absolutely love cooked over coal other than lobster yeah pork oh, okay uh, but iberian pork um Ooh. tops or, or actually, if I, if, yeah, or middle white pork. I don't know if you've come yeah, across yeah. middle white pork. Yeah. Incredibly good as well. Lovely and fatty, but the fat is, is so flavorful. Um, and I, I, just, I just love that flavor of pork, um, getting that slightly burnt edge, you know, not, not you know, burnt, but, but you yeah. know what I'm mean? sort of caramelized. Lightly charred, yeah. Oh, yeah, love that. Do you talk chops or like loin chops? Do you put chops straight on the barbecue or do you yes. marinate them first? No, I, I'm not so keen on marinating pork because I don't think it really needs it. But I, I think it needs the fat. So not the I like the the, uh, the neck end chops because they've got fat going through them and tend to be a bit more marbled. So yeah. We had uh, two questions from um, from someone called Ellie and Wooden Spoons, and they asked. I thought it was quite nice, really nice questions. If you hadn't become a, if you hadn't become a chef, 
what would you have become? <laughs> and then number two, is there a dish that you'd like to be remembered for? Or is there a dish you think you didn't, you, maybe you, you kind of feel that you, you evolved, you invented? So I thought those two questions were, were quite nice. And number one, if you weren't a chef, is there something you think you, you would have done? I mean, obviously your lineage is mm, <laughs> yeah. the, it's the family name. No. I can't imagine myself not being in, in the hospitality, you know, catering industry. So had I not been a chef, maybe I would have been, I don't know, a sommelier in front of house or something, you know, in, in the hospitality industry. I, I genuinely believe that there's a job for anybody in our industry. It is so vast and varied, um, you know, that it's, it's, it's a great, great industry to be involved in. So, yeah, chef or something to do with... Yeah. With our industry um and then the, the second question was um oh gosh i can't remember <laughs> is, there, is there a dish because i'm and we're, we're very very sorry to hear of your uncle pa uncle passing and i remember interviewing yeah. him once and, and and i'm very very sorry to hear it happened before lockdown but we do send our absolute condolences to the Rue family but he once said to me you know tartu citron was his thing he he was the person that caramelized that he, that he took he took a custard tart um, he, he flavoured it with lemon and he brulee it and it was the first time that sort of tart had been brulee and I wondered if you had uh, a dish that you know you'd like to be remembered by or you feel was something that you've evolved or you added an extra an extra element to and you feel was yours mm, you've just reminded me how how good a tart citron is and uh, we have got my my uncle Michel to, to thank for that and um, I think I might just Squeeze a few lemons and and, <laughs> and and make one and remind me of, of how good they are. Um, gosh, I I don't know. You know, I've I suppose the the evolution of the um, the offer at Le Gavroche, the à la carte at Le Gavroche, uh, since I've taken over has been you know there and I've put many a dish on on the à la carte. It, it's difficult to say, you know, one over another. But I suppose one one dish, the artichoke luculus, uh, which is an artichoke heart, which I love artichokes, um, filled with a uh, chicken mousse, duck liver, um, and it's served with with lots and lots of truffle, and I mean lots of truffle, a yeah. really good reduction, proper reduction sauce, um, and and that's you know that's always been very popular on the menu, and, and, and I always react to that one. And that's the port reduction. I think I've had the pleasure of eating that a few mm. years ago. That was absolutely wonderful with the with the duck cell, with the mushroom mixture, with yeah. the truffles. That was absolutely beautiful. But then you know, on the pastry side, that there's the passion fruit souffle with white chocolate ice cream. You know, I've put that on the menu about oh gosh, nearly twenty years ago when I when I first took over. I think it should be more than that. My God, <laughs> nearly thirty years ago. Um, <laughs> And and we just can't take it off the menu now because people come back for that and they they really love it. So so that's 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 one as well. The 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 acidity of the passion fruit with the lovely sort of sweetness and and soft texture of the white chocolate ice cream works beautifully. The dish I know you've well the dish I've you I've been very lucky for you to have made me a tart tatan before, which I know isn't yours. It's a very classic French mm. dish, but I have to say I've eaten a few tatans in my life. And yours was without a doubt the absolute finest. It was it was perfection in uh in, in puff pastry. So I I think of you and I think of Tart Tatan. Um, someone said it's it's battles of the beards, but I think you're you're definitely winning because yours is <laughs> your, yours is well, yours is trims. Yeah, I normally normally trim you know trim my beard once a week, but I thought well we're in lockdown, so let's let's put the beard trimmer away and see how far this goes. And you know if it goes on a bit, I might I might be able to do a little you know a little. Nat or something, you know, what do they call the little twirls that you tie? Oh, yeah, little twirls. Little twirls yeah. maybe in a month. I think here you're, you're definitely winning on the top front. Yeah, I am winning. But if I if I can get myself a nice mojito, <laughs> it'll remind me of my teenage years when punk was all right. How's it looking? Nearly there, huh? Looking yeah. okay. <laughs> now you mentioned the lobster, but someone's asked a really nice question. It's Father's Day on Sunday. Yep. Um, if if you could get if, you could, if someone else was cooking for you, you can have a special Father's Day lunch. What what would that be, or what would you what what, what would you like cooked for you? Yeah, that's an that's an interesting one because um, uh, well, I'm going to pop over and, and see Dad on Sunday, um, yeah. and I've been very very careful not to go over too often of because of lockdown and uh, and and to be honest, he's he has been he's hardly seen anybody, uh, and and he, he's taken it really badly. I mean that. Uh, you know, because 
he, my, my dad loves to entertain, goes out every lunch, um, you know, and he's 84 and, and he's, and he's serious, was seriously pissed off with all this. <laughs> seriously, shouldn't have said that, sorry. No, that's fine. Um, but he's, you know, so now, now that it's been eased a bit, I can pop in and see him and bring him a few treats. So Sunday he's getting, he's getting some treats. I, I, I doubt very much he's listening to this, so I can tell you. <laughs> uh, I've, I've planned to go to uh, uh, Derby's. Do you know Derby's, um, Robin Gill's place? Yes. In, in London, in Battersea. Yeah, yeah. Now he makes the most amazing, and I, I really do mean amazing, cinnamon buns, and he makes the most amazing kunia man, this um, uh, lovely, sweet, uh, Brittany kind of leavened pastry. Yeah. Uh, Half pastry, bit croissant, they split up. And, uh, yeah, they are mind blowing. Yeah. Uh, so um, I'm going to go and get loads of those. He makes the most amazing sourdough loaf as well. So I want to get loads of those. Uh, and I've got some DVDs of old classic French films uh, and, uh, and a good bottle of wine. And I'm going to pop around. Yeah, and see. They... But but for for me, um, I don't I don't know I don't know what my daughter's going to get me. I, I, I don't know. It should be a surprise, and hopefully it's a it's a nice surprise to eat and share. Yeah, an edible surprise. That'd be really nice. You've got me thinking what I've got to. Yeah, what what, what I'll be getting from my dad now. Um, I, so another question which I thought was lovely was you've been given some time off. Um, if if you could, when all this is over, take a take a food sabbatical. Of, I know you as a master chef. I can't think of a single part of the kitchen which which you're not uh, you're you're not amazing at. But if you could, if you could spend time with a supplier or a grower mm. or someone else in the food chain, maybe a couple of weeks, just to see what they do, who would it be, and 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 and, and why? Yeah, so um, I th I think I would go and pay a visit to. Um, the Lake District, and go and see my supplier of Herdwick lamb. Oh wow! Um, and go because they have really suffered. They've, they've suffered yeah. big time um, because of all the restaurants being shut and the, the hotels as well being shut. So they had literally thousands of lamb uh, waiting to go to slaughter and then to be used up uh, in the restaurants. Uh, and so you know, what do they do with all these lamb? And and of course, lambing season as well. So they had lambs ready to go, uh, lambs coming, and now they've got <laughs> they've got hills full of lamb, um, and you know. So I, I would love to go and see them, and, and you know, sort of uh, give give them a bit of encouragement and say, look, we're you know we're opening up soon, and uh, you know we're going to be pushing lamb and, and helping you guys out. But not just lamb; they do the most amazing beef as well, and rare breeds and, and you know, stuff like that. So and the Lake District is gorgeous, isn't it? It's a beautiful yeah. part the uk so yeah people like that they you know a lot of our, we don't think automatically of, of our suppliers because you think okay the restaurants and the hotels are shut mm. but it's a trickle down you know so you know all of our suppliers and and for the most part we, we buy the bulk of our food comes from the uk um yeah. and you know be it the fishermen or you know the, the the guys that get our scallops the divers uh or the growers uh the, the butchers whatever they're all suffering too, big time, big time. But it also means that the public can now get their hands on things, which because they're because obviously we, the last thing on earth we want is to go to waste. Which was going to be my last question. I think you've answered the hospitality has been one of the biggest hits with everything that's gone on. So, is there a small way that we can all help to support them? So would you say that that was buying local, buying buying uh, from specific breeders? Absolutely. I mean, I mean, buy local if possible and buy uh, from independent uh, shops. Yeah. Uh, I mean, supermarkets are great. And, you know, don't get me wrong, uh, especially for loo rolls, if you can get them. But it's <laughs> but, it, but it really is, um, you know, to support independent shops is so important. But then a lot of the restaurant suppliers um, are now uh, doing overnight delivery to, you know, um, uh, households. So you can you can go. On, uh, go online um, and uh, and you know do that and find out and they'll get delivered. The same suppliers that are supplying me can supply anybody. Um, listen, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you, Chef. I mean, I, honestly, it's a shame that we're not in the same room. And it's really lovely to see uh, you know a face that I, a face that I warm to and someone that I'm, I'm so used to interviewing live. But thank you ever so much for doing this for us. Hopefully, we will be again. We'll be together. Uh, again in November. Who knows what's going to happen? Oh, um, I'm sure yeah. we will. 
Yeah. Um, the Good Food Show and the Gardeners World Show would have been under the same roof. And there's going to be another live chat this evening with Monty Don from the Gardeners World team. Um, we'll be back. We'll be doing, we're doing Q&As every day. We've been doing them five days a week. We're doing Q&As every day at 3 p.m. We'll do another one with Rosie Burkett um, at tomorrow at 3 p.m. because Rosie would have been at the show as well. And then there's a Gardeners World chat at 5 p.m. Chuck, thank you ever so much for taking half an hour out to answer our questions. It's been an absolute joy talking to you. Um, and thank you, everyone, who's, who's, who's sent in questions. It feels a bit different doing it like this, but it's felt, it's felt, it's felt really good. And amazing T-shirt, incredible beard. I really hope to see you soon. See you soon. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Cheers.